morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, as Tom said, we have a really informative panel set up for everyone this morning. Um, we are really lucky to have three of, I would say, three of the foremost immigration attorneys in the U.S. Uh, to join us. Um, and I just wouldn't mind if you guys would start just by introducing yourselves and maybe say a little bit about yourselves and your practice. Ron? Sure. I'm Ron Clasco. Our law firm is Clasco Immigration Law Partners. We're one of the largest U.S. inbound immigration firms. Uh, chosen every year as one of the top firms in the country by U.S. News and World Report and Chambers Global. Uh, about one-third of our 75 people focused on investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, I have served five terms as chairman of the EB-5 Committee of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Uh, and one of our focuses is on entrepreneurs. Uh, we work with Harvard Business School, Wharton, and the Yale School of Management with their MBA programs. Uh, and uh, are, are focused very much on the unique immigration issues uh, relating to entrepreneurs in addition to our EB-5 practice. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> I'm Mark Davies. Um, I run a firm called Davies & Associates. We're very India-centric, so we have uh, people on the ground in India, have to be careful about the presence, um, Europe and the United States. And we uh, like to think we're fairly dominant in the Indian space. We have an entire practice team that focuses on assisting Indian entrepreneurs, high net worth individuals um, come to the United States using various visa types and, 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 and other places. So, uh, Good morning, everybody. My name is Mitch Wexler. I'm a partner with a, a, a large immigration law firm called Fragamen. We have about 4,000 employees worldwide and 50 offices uh, all around the world. Uh, I serve on the firm's uh, executive committee, been practicing immigration law for over 30 years, and I, I too have a significant EB-5 practice. It's, it's in what we call our private client practice. Um, most of my EB-5 uh, clients happen to be from uh, India as well. I'm located in Southern California. I manage Fragman's Los Angeles, Irvine, and San Diego offices and happy to be here this morning. Great. Thanks, guys. Uh, Tom had touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think we can all agree you can't pick up a newspaper or read the news uh, without seeing immigration front and center. The current administration is really, has really targeted limiting immigration to the U.S., not just illegal, not just key slogans like build the wall, but really behind the scenes limiting legal immigration. Uh, that's had a significant impact on the H-1B community, and others that are looking to establish businesses and come to the U.S. So I thought we'd start this morning by having our three experts sort of give an overview of the things that they see happening under the current U.S. immigration policy. Ron? Sure. Uh, Jeff, I think you've, you've hit it exactly right. Uh, uh, people hear all the time about attempts to deal with illegal immigration. You don't hear so much about the attempts to cut back on legal immigration. So uh, what, what, there is a, an attempt being made uh, by the present administration to cut back legal immigration by 50 percent of all types. Uh, I'm focused most especially, I'm heading up a, a national task force uh, dealing with H's and L's, uh, and, and we're coordinating with business groups. Uh, 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 attempts to challenge the new restrictions on H's and L's. Uh, but he here's what's going on, folks. You, you have uh, uh, the, the president has chosen as his attorney general, Jeff Sessions, who I think was recognized uh, universally as the most uh, restrictionist immigration senator in the U.S. Senate. Uh, the architect of, uh, of Attorney General Sessions' immigration policy, Stephen Miller, uh, is the top advisor to President Trump. Uh, the uh, senator who has attempted over many, many years to get H&L and other uh, restrictive legislation passed is Senator Grassley of Iowa. Senator Grassley was given free reign to appoint the, one of his staffers as the director of the Immigration Service and another of his staffers as the director of policy of the Immigration Service. Uh, and they are doing, honestly, a very impressive, coordinated, strategic strategy of figuring out ways without changes in legislation to cut back on the number of people who can legally get visas here 
and the number of people who can get green cards here. So we're going to be talking about some of the specifics uh, of that, that affect many of you who are on H visas or L visas or doing EB1Cs uh, or, or doing EB2s. We're going to talk about that in some detail, but uh, you should know that we're in a time, and I've been doing immigration law for more than 30 years, that is the most restrictive that we've ever dealt with. And frankly, that's one of the reasons uh, that EB5 becomes even more attractive. Right. And, and Mark, you're on the ground a lot in India. Um, how have you seen it impact uh, people who are in India looking to come to the U.S. and also other Indians that, you, that are already based in the U.S.? Sure. Well, if you read the media in India, this is no shock. You know, the Indian IT industry is currently up in arms about uh, the increasing restriction on H-1B. So what does that mean? It means that you know, if you're here on an H-1B or if you're a business considering to use it, you have to start looking at viable alternatives, and um, there, there's a number of those. Um, on the ground in India was, was Jeff's question. So we've seen a spike demand in EB-5. Um, sort of a, going back, I think in 2014, there were 99 cases. Uh, according, to, um, according to a FOIA file, there was 99 I-526s. Last year, we think there was 500. So restrictions in the market. The other thing with H-1B is the student demographic. You know, they can no longer rely on uh, the ability to use that program. There's also domestic things in India happening. So we don't only do the United States, we cover some other international markets too. Um, as you might tell with my accent, I did not have my first license to practice law in the United States. So we definitely see uh, Indians looking to uh, access foreign markets, move to foreign markets. But always remember one thing. The United States is by far the largest um, consumer market in the entire world. Um, and a lot of our clients in India want to access that market. They want to come here. They want to access that market. Um, they want to emasculate or get rid of the uh, middleman, gain those margins. Uh, and, and some of them are looking for financing too. So there's a whole sort of roster of domestic things um, and uh, changes in US immigration policy that we see leading to uh, a very stiff increase in demand for certain um, visas in India right now. Right, and I think it's safe to say overall, even though this current administration uh, has taken a posture that could seem a little bit hostile toward immigration, I don't think it's uh, changed demand within India at all, people's desire to come no, to the U.S. absolutely not. Um, I would say, if I would say anything, it's increased. There's increased demand for different reasons. I mean, there's three big categories that we see in India of people. There's business people and entrepreneurs. They want to access the U.S. market for different reasons. Then, you know, there's workers who, who come here, they want a job, and, 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 and that's not diminishing in, in terms of a need. And then there's the students who come here to study. And those are, I think, three, you know, significant ways to segment the market. And there's reasons why all of them are, are still hot on the U.S. and want to come here. Right. And Mitch, to uh, put you on the spot a little bit here, um, I want you to predict um, the Trump administration, which nobody else seems to be able to do, but do you see any changes possibly on the horizon that would give some relief to Indian investors or Indian uh, entrepreneurs who are looking to come to the U.S.? Well, in, in my opinion, the short answer is, is no. There's nothing really too optimistic to, uh, to uh, be anticipated in the current administration. Uh, as, as Ron alluded to, uh, every which way uh, we're seeing roadblocks. Uh, we've all been doing uh, business or white collar immigration law for a long time. And there has always historically been a variety of tools in our toolbox, so to speak, H-1Bs, L-1s, all kinds of work visas. Uh, we used to be able, with great certainty, to predict the outcome of those types of applications. Now that certainty is out the window, which is kind of wreaking havoc. Uh, to individual applicants and U.S. employers seeking the services of foreign nationals. So with all that uh, uncertainty, uh, companies are looking for other options. They're uh, outsourcing projects or outsourcing jobs. So if I take my crystal ball out, uh, at least over the next few years, um, I don't see anything positive coming out of Washington. Um, quite to the contrary, uh, also as was uh, uh, alluded to, the standards of typical adjudication for all these other 
uh, work visa categories and other immigration benefits have just uh, skyrocketed. However, if there is a, a, a gleam of hope out there, uh, in my opinion, it is in the EB-5 program. Um, that uh, uh, has seen some challenges as well, but there's, there's significantly more predictability in the, in the EB-5 program. And uh, primarily because of the relative uh, short uh, lifespan of an EB-5 case. In about two to three years or so, sometimes even sooner, an Indian national can obtain a green card. That's unheard of. Those of you in the room who are familiar with EB-2, EB-3, the second and, and third employment-based uh, green card categories that backlog 10 to 15 years or so, uh, which really uh, drives interest uh, in the EB-5 program now. So with my crystal ball, Jeff, that's, that's the only glimmer of uh, any positivity that I see. Okay. Uh, well, Ron, we, when we spoke a little earlier today, you mentioned that there, was, uh, there were some legal things going on. Um, people were challenging the US, U.S. government with their actions toward legal immigration. Um, what have you seen on that front? Yeah, there's, there's uh, if you're interested in what I'm talking about, we just did a blog on this of how some of the restrictions specifically affect Indian nationals, uh, which would be on our Classical Law website uh, from about three or four weeks ago. There's a whole lot of things going on. Some affect everybody, some affect Indian nationals more than others. Um, so let, let's just look at the whole scenario. Number one, the H-1B lottery is becoming just more and more of a lottery. If you have a bachelor's degree, you may have 20-some percent chance of, of winning a lottery, a master's somewhat higher, but it's, you can't count on that anymore. Uh, the Immigration Service is uh, changing the definition of what a specialty occupation is for H-1B. So we're seeing unprecedented denials, especially in the tech field, but also in others, uh, on the basis that the job must require not a, a degree, but only one possible degree. If you can do the job with either an, a tech degree or an engineering degree, they're saying that's no longer an H-1B. There will be a whole lot of series of coordinated litigations around the country dealing with that, but that's a very, very big issue right now. Um, the Immigration Service, for the first time, is challenging H-1Bs based on wages. They're saying, well, we believe the wage is too low. The Immigration Service doesn't have the authority to do that. That's given to the Labor Department. This is also going to be challenged in federal court, but there are a whole series of denials on that. One of the worst things is that the Immigration Service uh, issued a policy memorandum saying that we will no longer give deference to previous approvals. So therefore, if you have been in the U.S. on, on an H-1B for three years and you go to apply for an extension, they're saying, we don't care that we approved the same job before. We may not approve it now under our new standards. So uh, our clients who are on H-1Bs no longer have the certainty that even if they're willing to wait a long time to get a green card, that they're going to be able to, to stay in the U.S. Um, well, let's assume you've started the green card process. Uh, we all know probably in this room that if you're from India and you're EB2 or EB3, um, you probably have realistically, if you're starting now, a, at least a minimum of a 12 to 15 year wait uh, to be able to get a green card. Uh, and you know some of the more nefarious things that relate to that, uh, and, and we deal with this every day with our clients, is that during those 12 or 15 years, if God forbid you change jobs, or even worse, you get promoted to a different job, uh, during that whole period of time, you have to start all over again. Uh, and, and, and that's just a, a very, very difficult situation. Uh, there are attempts that the administration is looking at now to uh, legislate away what's called AC-21 which is the, the provision in the year 2000 that said that if you're in this long quota waiting period, you're gonna be able to get H extensions if you need to for the next 15 years. That may be legislated away even within the next year. Um, so we, we for a while now told our Indian clients, well, you know, EB2, EB3 isn't gonna lead anywhere uh, for a very long time, so let's look at EB1. Uh, that could be multinational manager, EB1C, or what's called EB1A, extraordinary ability. Well, as of this year, there is a quota backlog in EB1 back to 2012, and that's not likely going away anytime soon. 
So even though uh, we have a very big EB-5 practice, but we've never viewed with our Indian clientele in the U.S. that EB-5 was, was a major focal point, but whether it was the best option for our Indian clients, it's now through that whole confluence of events become for many of them the only option that's going to give them the ability to uh, get a green card in a reasonable period of time, be able to have some flexibility to switch employers or get promoted within the same job. So that may be a long-winded answer to your question, Jeff, <laughs> but I think there's an answer in there somewhere. No, absolutely. I mean, uh, the one thing that, and this is a good transition point, is uh, H-1B, future of H-1B looks fairly bleak. There are other alternatives. Ron touched on some. Um, besides EB-5 as well, but maybe Mark, you could just uh, talk about some of the other options in a little more detail other than the H-1B. Sure. I mean, I think it's helpful to think of it in terms of who you are and what you're trying to do. So if you're, you know, like a lot of our clients in India, um, you're an entrepreneur setting up a business or, or, or trying to access the U.S. market, um, we found the L-1A visa to be a very, uh, very good option for those people. Um, that, that would be one option that basically is an intercompany transfer. Not everybody meets the requirements for L1A. Um, if you don't, then there's EB-5. Well, there's EB-5 regional center and then there's EB-5 direct. EB-5 direct um, is often misquoted as your own business. It's not. It's just an EB-5 that's not really through a regional center, but a lot of people would use that in the context of their own business. That's sort of challenging. And it's, it, 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 if you're one of the few people that sort of suit that program, that's good for you. But, it, but it's a challenging program. Um, the other option we've done, sort of just a very small number of, and we have actually more this year than ever before, is the ability to, to get an E2 visa by getting a passport in a third country. Um, India, unlike uh, Bangladesh, unlike Pakistan, is not an E2 country. There are some ways to backdoor that. That is not the right solution for most people, but it is for a couple. Um, so there are some different solutions. Ron was talking about EB-1. There's EB-1C, there's EB-1A. There's some, some different solutions under EB-1, but for the reasons he articulated, um, that's becoming increasingly difficult too. So you begin to look at sort of the flexibility of these options and what people really want to do. If you can get a green card through EB-5, it's generally uh, regional center-based. That's generally you're outsourcing all of the difficulties and troubles of doing it in your own business to a regional center. Note, be careful with the regional center you pick, that they're really properly qualified to be doing that. Uh, and you get, a, you get a piece of plastic that enables, that gives you a great deal of flexibility to do different businesses, to launch different things. So, um, um, you know, we have some of our EB, approved people with EB-5 sitting in this room. So I can't tell you who they are because that's <laughs> not fair, but they're sitting in this room. Um, so that, that's one category. Then you look at the student category. Well, used to be that Indian clients, you know, the, the kids got OPT and they went on to H1B. Again, you know, for the reasons that Ron articulated, that's really no longer a secure strategy. That's not something you can rely on. So what we see is a lot of clients gifting money to their children and uh, then those funds being used to, to, to justify EB-5. One thing I think we'll sort of talk about later is the Reserve Bank, when you're moving funds from India, you have to be careful. The Reserve Bank of India have some regulations around this, as probably everybody knows, uh, and they recently just got more complicated about, or through a clarification about, uh, about a month ago. So, you know, we, we can talk about that, but it can be done, it just has to be done carefully. Um, then you've got sort of the category of workers, you know, which we've talked about, alternative visas on that. We've actually used the O-1 a few times, which is a category for outstanding people. You know, I guess we've been lucky. Our firm's never had a denial of one of those cases, but I think we've been lucky somewhat because, because there are denials in that space. And if an O-1 was that easy, everybody would do it, so, so it's not that easy. Um, but, but those would be some of the alternatives we see in the market. Great, thanks. Um, by show of hands, I'm just curious with this crowd, how many people here have heard of EB-5 or have some type of knowledge about it before they came to this today? Okay, so about three quarters of the room. And how many of you know someone who has gone through the program or started the program? Just a few. Okay, just curious about the penetration in, in, inside this community. Um, Mitch, if you would just talk for a, a couple minutes maybe about um, what, what are the particular benefits uh, of an EB-5 visa 
uh, compared to other visas, and maybe specifically with regard to how it would work for an entrepreneur? Uh, well, the, the primary benefit of pursuing EB-5 compared to some of the other uh, 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 immigration categories discussed is it leads to a, per, a permanent green card. There are, the, in the EB-2 and the EB-3 process that was discussed, that too leads to a, a permanent green card, but it's going to take a decade and a half, most likely. Now, the EB-5 uh, process is kind of bifurcated. You get a much faster green card, but it's what they call conditional or, or temporary. That's good for two years. At the, end of, at the end of that two year period, there's another complex filing that has to be done to make sure that, uh, for example, the requisite number of jobs have been created and that the, the business did what it was supposed to be doing. And then the conditional nature is removed. So ultimately, the primary benefit, of course, of an EB-5 is you get an unconditional green card. Um, five years after getting that first green card status, the temporary or the conditional one, the individual is eligible to apply for U.S. citizenship, which is always a significant benefit once you're a citizen. There's a broader class of family members that you can immigrate. At this time, this, this, the, the whole family immigration system is under uh, uh, attack as well. But as we sit here today, uh, most of those, uh, all those categories still exist. But um, for uh, entrepreneurs in particular, uh, as Mark mentioned, there's two types, two varieties, two flavors of EB-5, direct and, and uh, uh, regional center-based. About 90, north of 95% of the applications are regional center-based, only because it's, in most cases, simpler. You're making an equity investment, you're writing out a check uh, uh, in an enterprise that ultimately is going to result in the creation of at least uh, 10 jobs. And you're outsourcing all the administrative requirements, the reporting requirements that are pretty burdensome. If the entrepreneur, and we're assuming for this scenario that it's an entrepreneur making the application, if he or she is uh, uh, using her own business as the subject of an EB-5, all those obligations are on her. Uh, importantly, in a direct program application, as opposed to regional center, the jobs have to be uh, a direct full-time employee, W-2 jobs. The formula is, is much more lenient for regional centers. We don't have to get into the, into the weeds, but it's much more uh, uh, lenient in the job creation methodology. So entrepreneurs can do kind of a blend. They can, if they feel their job, their company that they want to launch in the U.S. is a good EB-5 type enterprise, that can certainly be the subject of the application. If not, it's recommended in most cases to pursue the regional center variety. Uh, or you can mix and match. Uh, we have several clients that are pursuing a regional center-based EB-5 application and then launching their own entrepreneurial endeavor on the side uh, that may not have been a good candidate for EB-5, but a very, uh, a really good business plan and, and, and uh, one that has potential for high return, but just not uh, a good EB-5 candidate. There are a lot of companies, especially in this tech environment, where uh, staffing is very lean but very profitable. So that's a great business, but it's not a great EB-5 business. So you can kind of mix and match some of these uh, solutions for the entrepreneur. Great. Um, and, and so you just mentioned uh, you know, someone not being a good candidate for EB-5. So Mark, what, what does someone have to do to qualify to do EB-5? Um, I think there are a couple of things that you have to be able to do before you can even think about EB-5. One is you have to have half a million dollars. Um, my experience with Indian clients is every single Indian client I've ever had has said, don't worry, my funds are white. And usually they are white, but documenting funds are white and them being white is two different things. And we've had issues with HUFs, we've had money going around in circles. It, it takes time to properly document your source of funds. If your source of funds are not properly documented, you're certainly running a high risk of an RFE and a, a denial of your process. So you've got to have the, the, the capital, but it's got to be provable. Um, then you, you obviously you want to be somebody who can actually afford to do the program. You know, regional centers are going to ask you to be an accredited investor. They change the US immigration forms to disclose some of this information to the service too. Um, so, so that's one, you've got to have the money. Two, you've got to be able to get the money, I think, to the United States. I mean, sitting here, a lot of our clients in this part of the country have earned money in the United States, and, and that's not an issue. But, you know, we talked about 
Um, I mentioned sort of this, this topic before, you know, are you qualified to do EB5? Um, are you qualified to do that investment? Then you've got to be willing to not say goodbye, but tie up your half a million dollars for five, six years. It depends on the project. Um, but for, for a long period of time, you've got to be willing and able to do that. Um, just a you know little footnote because it's not always true. You also have to have a you know clean background in terms of criminal record and immigration policy. Um, certain things can cause a block to that. We had a client who came to New York and was late for a meeting uh, and had already got his conditional green card. And he decided that uh, rather than buy a ticket because he didn't have time, he'd jump the turnstile. And then he ended up in an altercation with the police, and it ended up in a big mess and. And you, so you, you have to be careful of those kinds of things too. But those, I think, would be some of the things you need to. Think. And then I think probably you need to think about what is it, what is it you really want to do, right? I mean, if you want a green card, then I can sell you I can sell you a piece of green plastic for half a million dollars. That's that that that's easily done. But that's not what most people want. I mean, you have to think about what is it I really want. Do I want to come to America and operate a business with flexibility? It might be a good option, or do I really need something less than that? And I think when you speak to an immigration lawyer, you should have some clarity of purpose. What is it you really want in mind? You know, Mark, when, when you throw around the 500,000, I think we probably should mention to people that 500,000 may become a dinosaur in the near yeah. future. Uh, we, it's an unusual situation. This is the same amount, uh, this 500,000, that uh, was the amount when the program started in 1990. What else has not gone up since 1990? So it's now one of the least expensive programs in the world. Um, I'm not so sure it's still going to be 500,000 if I have the, the privilege of speaking to you a year from today. It's certainly very possible that the amount will be going up, probably at least double. So um, if you're interested in EB-5 um, for a variety of reasons, and that's one of them, uh, the, the time uh, is as good now as it's ever going to be. And there's another reason on this too, that for, for Indians I think it's true. Nobody knows when the amount's going to change. I think everybody thinks the amount will change. We just don't know when. But India also fa faces potentially getting into retrogression about a year from now. So that may cause a further delay in the processing of a case. So that's the reason a lot of our clients are filing cases now. Um, to, 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 to try and avail themselves of an opportunity potentially to get ahead of, ahead of that sort of one coming up. So the re reason Ron mentioned and that reason added together, you know, if you're thinking of EB-5, you'd be well advised to think about doing it now. Yeah, you, even I'm sure you see the same thing, Mark, with, with your clients, but for our Indian clients, a lot of them have the investment amount coming from gifts. Right. So True. yet another issue that's on the horizon, when the, uh, assuming there is legislation, to increase the investment amount to a million or higher, um, the drafts of the legislation that we've been dealing with have provisions to cut back on the ability of certain people to give gifts that can be used for EB-5. So right now there's complete freedom. Your gift can come from your uncle, your best friend. Uh, I don't have too many best friends giving me 500,000, but maybe you do. Um, but there will be restrictions on that if and when there's new legislation. Right. And, and I think that leads us to what, uh, what types of investors have we seen in EB-5 over the past few years? We've seen India, the numbers explode the, the, uh, from India. They've doubled every year for the last four years, and they'll probably well, way more than double this year. Um, but Mitch, what types of people do you see? What's, your, what's the common profile of your investor who comes to you and wants to do EB-5? Well, especially from India, as I said, most of my EB-5 work is in India. There's basically two uh, predominant profiles. One is um, a, a young family in India with um, two children, maybe uh, uh, 10 and 12 years old. Um, and they know, the parents know, that they want those two children to go to university in the United States. That's a huge driver in India, uh, U.S. education. And they realize that when the children become university age, if they have a green card in their, their pocket, uh, it's going to be much easier because who knows what the F-1 student visa program is going to be like. And then once they graduate with the F-1, they get to avoid all the uh, H-1B visa uh, uh, heartache that the, the panel previously discussed. Uh, tuition rates 
are going to be a lot less if you have a green card in, in, in certain universities. So that's, that's one typical profile. Another one that's uh, uh, even more popular right now because of the reasons we've been discussing is the Indian H-1B population already in the United States or Indian F-1 students that might be on OPT. Now, OPT is optional practical training. It's a, it's a, a work permitted status after graduation of a foreign student. Um, so the H-1B folks uh, get to uh, have H-1B status, enjoy H-1B status for up to six years. It's employer specific and it has all the, uh, the trials and tribulations that the panel spoke about, first getting it and then maintaining it. So they want to get uh, their green cards as quickly as possible. Many of these H-1B visa holders in the United States uh, are working for technology companies that recently went public and the, they're at a certain level where they get stock and they could simply write out a check themselves. We have several uh, uh, clients that are doing that and the source of funds scenario is, is quite simple. Most of the time though, as, as uh, Mark mentioned, is that the money's got to come from somewhere else. Because by definition, if you're a student here, you're, you're 20 years old, or if you're a young H-1B visa holder, you're in your early to mid-20s, you haven't amassed that kind of wealth. Um, so gifting is, is most uh, uh, common and, and most popular. So in answer to the question, young families in India and, and H-1B non-immigrants in the U.S. are the two predominant profiles I see too. Ron, you agree? Is that what you've seen yeah, as well? Yeah, it, it's, it's totally, I agree, uh, Mitch, yes. Um, uh, very different profiles between Indians in India or Dubai and Indians in the U.S. Our clients uh, who are Indians in the, uh, Indian folks in the U.S. are, most of them are, are H's, uh, some are F's, but most are H's. Uh, most are already in the EB2 or EB3 quota weight. And I think, I mean, we've kind of known for a long time that the EB2 and EB3 for India, if you just do the math, is going to be, you know, well over a decade. Uh, I, I think for whatever reason, it's only become understood by, the, by everyone that this is the case. So we've seen a huge uptick in the interest in EB5 uh, among our Indian national clientele in the U.S., who now realize that this is not another year or two or three wait, but it could be another seven or 10 or 12 year wait, and that's just an untenable situation. So I would say a good majority of our EB-5 uh, clients from India in the U.S. Uh, never planned as far as their immigration strategy doing EB-5. It was really the last thing in the world they thought about. Uh, but as they look at the options, and I think the, the, the real dagger was all of a sudden the EB-1 quota backlog popping up. Uh, and, and people are beginning to understand really just in the last several months that probably because of the increase in demand in, uh, from uh, Indian nationals for EB-5, there most likely will in the future, possibly as soon as 2019, be a quota backlog for EB-5 India, nowhere near as bad as China, uh, but still a quota backlog. So you put together that all the other possibilities already have quota backlogs, um, uh, and the fact that EB-5 in the future may have a quota backlog, uh, and that the amount hasn't gone up yet, and that, that's our profile, that's our client who's saying, you know, I never really wanted to do EB-5, um, but let's talk about it now. Yeah, we've definitely seen a lot of that. And, and Mark, when, when investors approach you or potential investors approach you from India, um, what would you say is their biggest concern before moving forward with EB-5 and, and how does that compare to what they really should be concerned with? Sure. I would say the market's changed a little bit, but certainly five years ago when we were sort of, you know, it was basically my firm and I think a couple of others there, clients would always want to be in control of their own capital. So they always wanted to do a direct TB5. And I think there was a confusion between what do you really want? You want to get a green card and you want to get your money back. And I think there was a confusion around security of capital. People assume that just because I control my own money, it's safer. And you know, that's a fallacy. If you look at, I've been in this, these types of real estate transactions my entire career. And if you look at sort of the options available through regional center EB5, you will see that some of them are very well structured and the investors are very well secured. And comparing that to 
investing your money in I know, opening a car wash in Los Angeles or something. Bluntly, comparing the risk level on that is absurd. So that's, the, you know, that, that's one of the things you have to get your, your, your mind around, I think, as an investor coming to this. The EB-5 um, green card route, uh, from a perspective of a lawyer who advises real estate investors, um, can be extremely secure compared to other options, or secured compared to other options. And then you look at sort of, you know, how likely am I to get my green card? Well, if you think about sort of running an operating business, you've got to employ 10 employees directly. And US immigration don't only look to say, do you have 10 employees? They look to say, do you really need the jobs? So the idea of sort of keeping unnecessary jobs, one, is doesn't make any sense economically, and two, you might not get approved anyway. So you have to think about when you come to it, most, people, most of our clients want certainty of green card and certainty of capital. And I think there's some confusion around that and sort of being able to, being able to control things. I do think, and it's my personal belief, that um, most investors in EB-5 uh, talk to an immigration lawyer and they should also talk to someone who understands real estate finance because some of those deals have major flaws in them, others don't. And you've got no way of knowing unless you, I say, unless you have about a decade of experience in real estate finance. But um, that's just the way EB-5 is. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, that people confuse control and risk. And if you begin to look at some of those EB-5 um, regional center deals that are well structured, they compare extremely favorably to other options in the market. As, as they say, Mark, the, by law, the EB-5 investment has to be at risk but it doesn't have to be risky or unnecessarily risky. So that's, that's what has to be managed right there. Right, there are two risks that go on in this. There's the financial risk that you're making the investment, and there's, there's the immigration risk. Mitch, I mean, how common are denials uh, in, in EB-5 from the immigration side? Uh, not that uh, common. Statistically, you know, by far the majority, 90% or so uh, are, are getting approved. There's a, sp there's, uh, a spate of, of denials, of course, in both direct and regional center. But uh, EB-5 generally, uh, broadly speaking, has an extremely high success rate. But certainly on the front end, uh, significant due diligence has to be done, uh, not only in selecting immigration counsel, the immigration regional center, if you're gonna go the regional center route, and the project. So regional centers are basically, you know, a, a piece of dirt. It's a geography, and they kind of administer projects within that the, the confines. So uh, as long as the uh, appropriate due diligence is is done with all those stakeholders, EB-5 is relatively um, uh, successful. Yeah, there's, there's there's two reasons that an EB-5 petition could be denied. One has to do with the investor and the other has to do with the project you've invested in. The very large majority of the denials are more related to the project people invest in, and that's why it's so critical to do great due diligence in choosing a regional center and a project. So there, there's a, a pretty small percentage of people who get denied because of the inability to prove their source or path of funds. It's a lot of work to do it, but in most cases, especially if you have an experienced immigration lawyer, your chances of success on that are, are likely to be very good. Um, where the highest percentage of denials come is if there's a, a bad project out there um, and there's 100 investors in it, that's 100 denials having nothing to do with investor all because of the project. So it, it is really, it's not like, well, just invest in some, if, uh, it's not like a regional center is come, you know, is a gift from God that if you're a regional center, that means you're going to be approved. Uh, there are good regional centers and bad regional centers. There are good projects and bad projects. Uh, and it's absolutely critical in the process that you choose both the right regional center and the right project. And the, the investor-based risk that Ron uh, references uh, is assessed and managed up front. I, I, I can speak for the three of us confidently that when we consider taking on an EB-5 client, the, the, one, the first issue that we discuss is the source of funds right. and the path of funds, making sure it's white money. And if it's just going to be too challenging, we let the client know or the prospective That's client know right. that it's just not going to be a winner. So you can manage That's that right. up front That's rather right. than taking on a bad case, in other That's words. That's right. That's right. And I think, you know, to be honest, 
I think all three of us do. Working with someone who understands, in, if the money's coming from India, working with somebody who understands India and can look at your, have someone look at your source of funds up front, I think, you know, I think Mitch is right. I think that's a good step. Otherwise, you might be spinning your wheels, wasting a lot of time, and ultimately filing a case that's destined for, 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 for a less than successful outcome. Hey, hey Jeff, can I make a, a point on one of my profiles? Sure. Uh, I'll just take a, a moment, but it, it comes up in almost every one of my EB-5 consultations, especially when it's the scenario where it's the young family in India with two children, 10 and 12 years old. Many times, mom and dad don't even want the green card. So we have to talk about what are the obligations once they get a green card. Um, there's all sorts of physical presence requirements. And there's things that can be filed and obtained to manage maintaining green card status without physically being in the United States for, ex for extended periods of time. So these are conversations that we have up front too to find out what the actual expectation is. Do, does the whole family really plan on packing up and moving once they get the green card? If so, when? Maybe a year or two or three or four years down the road? Maybe never. At what point is it safe to decouple mom and dad's green cards from the kids? So that could be done too. So these issues are very common when the applicants are a young family in India. And just to go back to the denial uh, portion, um, from the regional center side, which is the side I represent, uh, denials, if the project is, is sound, denials are very rare. We've had, I don't know, 4,000 approvals. We've had somewhere around 19 denials in our history. Those were always due to uh, someone getting arrested or having something in their background or something happening uh, that they fully didn't disclose. Um, from our side, our job is to make sure the project is successful. We trust the immigration attorneys to make sure that your source of funds and your application is done right. We don't work with any immigration attorney. We only work with immigration attorneys that have experience in EB-5 in that country where the petition is coming from. And that's important to us. And that's why we don't have denials. And that's why I know, for instance, these three gentlemen, if they're going to take a case, it's going to get approved. Um, I can't guarantee that, but, that's, but they don't want a denial. I don't want a denial. So we understand that. So chances are, if your case is iffy, you'll speak to one of these professionals, and they'll say, you know what, we shouldn't file this. Yeah, you know, Jeff, it's uh, what we, you know, in fairness to the audience, they should realize that not every regional center out there is Can-Am. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, there are, it's not like Can-Am is the only good one, but not all of them are great. Uh, and uh, uh, one unfortunately expanding part of our practice is getting brought in uh, on projects that go bad, sometimes by an SEC receiver, uh, you know, sometimes when uh, the, the immigration service is challenging parts of the program. And, and that's why we always stress to our clients to be very, very careful in choosing the right regional center and the right project. All right. Um, we're going to start to wrap up uh, for the next panel. I just wanted to, just to let everyone know, this was purposely just laying the groundwork for the next panel, which will talk more in depth about the EB-5 process, how it works, et cetera. Um, before we get to that, I don't know if there are any questions. We will take like a five-minute question, question and answer period, and then we'll move on to the next panel. And uh, their expectation is that uh, they'll get the EB-5 visa while they're investing uh, money into my company. What kind of risk I run in as an entrepreneur or as a business owner over here? Well, first, first of all, uh, if, let's say you have five folks from India who want to invest in your company and get a green card. So number one is that we have to show that, they're going to, that you're going to be creating 50 additional jobs. So if you have a company with, uh, with 17 employees today, uh, and in the scenario I just gave, we're going to have to show that within a defined period of time, you're now going to have 60 full-time W-2 employees. So one risk you have is, you know, will, will that happen? Now, you're not making a contract to guarantee it, uh, but in most cases, if there's going to be a significant number of investors, there's going to be, uh, uh, you're going to have to do filings uh, or, or pr uh, private placement memoranda, offering documents uh, that subject you to the jurisdiction of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, and if there's any misrepresentations in there that result in the investors not getting their green cards, you could have ramifications there. Uh, and misrepresentations can lead to civil lawsuits. So as a general rule, if you're doing everything in good faith, you don't have exposure. 
Uh, but if there's anything that, if, if things go wrong and you have a bunch of unhappy investors who've lost their money and not gotten the green card, uh, they have various forms of relief. Great. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm running a consulting company here. As Ron has pointed out that uh, you're facing the denials uh, in terms of uh, the specialty occupations and uh, the wages. Then I'm uh, seeing that, I, uh, is there any way that a staffing company here already established for the last 10 years to get into this EB-5 category? Is it advisable? Is it doable? Well, well, remember to do an EB-5, you have to be an investor creating 10 jobs. Now, assuming that you're not a regional center, there's rent a region, there's different things, but you kind of get down to the fact that you have to create 10 jobs, uh, 10 additional jobs, as Ron just said. Um, so bringing in large numbers of people on EB-5 turns out not to be really very viable for that reason. What you can do is, you know, if these people wanted to do a regional center EB-5 by themselves, they'd have a green card and they can do whatever they want to do. But, um, but using EB-5 for your business could be challenged because each of those investors is going to have 10 jobs attached to him or her. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, yes. Well, the question is, when you mention uh, regional center, is it something federal or state? So just to be clear, and, and the next panel will go into more detail, um, regional center is a geographic designation. It's an area in which an EB-5 project will be structured. So we have a regional center, for instance, uh, in the entire state of Texas. So we can develop projects in there, and they could qualify under the, the regional center program. The, the question is the rules, um, do they vary by state or is, is it $500,000 everywhere? So yeah, it does not vary by state. This is all federal law and, and federal law says that the investment amount is a million dollars unless you're in something called a targeted employment area. And a targeted employment area in any state could be either a rural area, not near a big city, or it could be a high unemployment area. Now where the states get involved is in showing high unemployment. You might wonder, well, how is it possible to have high unemployment areas in, uh, in, in the middle of Manhattan or Fort Lauderdale or Scottsdale, Arizona? Uh, and, and the way it's done, and this is perfectly legal today and always has been, is that uh, if an economist can put together contiguous census tracts and show that it could be 10, it could be 37, it could be 52, but show that the average unemployment rate of those contiguous census tracts is at least 150% of the national average unemployment rate, then any investment in those 32 census tracts is considered a targeted employment area investment. And to do that, uh, in, if it's Arizona, the state of Arizona would have to certify that the, these unemployment uh, rates for these contiguous census tracts is correct. But it's basically a federal law, and the federal law is the same in every state. Yeah, I've seen this in India. I've had clients come to us and say, oh, I met somebody yesterday who says if I invest in this project in, name the place, Little Rock, Arkansas, for 300,000, I'm getting my EB-5. False. Um, you, you, you can't do an EB-5 for less than half a million dollars. And then there'll be some story about, well, you can do half a, uh, 300,000 now, and then you can have an obligation for the other 200 and pay it off over time. Things like that theoretically can be possible, but it, it's just not worth getting into that. Um, you, the theoretically possible, but in the kinds of projects you see, honestly, without seeing the details, what goes off in my head is like, the, is, 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 there's, there's something, that, uh, something that's a scam in here somewhere. Um, but but I think that maybe that's where that's coming from. And yeah, to clear one, yeah, one basic point, sorry, just um, if you invest in an EB-5 project in New York, you, you have no obligation to the state of New York to live there, anything. You can live anywhere in the country in the U.S. You can work, you can not work, you can retire, you can do whatever you want. Just sometimes people get confused, well, I don't want to invest in a regional center in New York because I don't want to live in New York. So that's not the case. Um, I think we have time for maybe two more questions or so. Are we okay? Uh, yeah, hi. 
Um, I'm on H1B, okay, and uh, we have an idea and we built a product. Uh, do you think we can uh, go and register a company and patent the uh, product uh, on that company? Okay, but I still want to continue working for my employer on H1B. Yeah. Um, so anyone? Oh, I'm sorry. So what was the, what I think the question, question is, question? can you stay here on your H1B while you do an EB-5? Can you have, no, um, no, no. Can you yeah. start your own company? While, That's I'm, I'm sure I understood the question. Yeah, carried. So I'm on H1B, and we have a, a we have built a prototype with some of my friends, and I want to uh, register a company and patent my product now. Do you think I can continue on H1B, work for my employer, and start my own company as well? Well, if if you're on an H1B and 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 you are are not far off enough along in the green card process to be able to get an employment document, then you can only work for your H1B employer. However, it is possible to have multiple H1B employers. So if you're let, let's just say you're on an H1B and your company's doing an EB2 for you, but you're now starting your own company and you also want to work part time for your own company. Your own company can file an H-1B petition for you, part-time or full-time, and you can then work part-time for your company and whatever full-time for the other company. Okay. No problem with that as long as every company you're working for has filed an H-1B petition for you. Now, as an entrepreneur, there are all sorts of challenges in getting H-1Bs for your own company. If you're interested in this, we, I have a number of PowerPoints on, on this subject. Uh, on our, if you go to our events page in March of 18, you'll see a presentation I did to the Harvard MBAs on this. Uh, but the, uh, the key is that if, it, if it's a company that you own all or most of, you're going to have to show that uh, uh, through various structuring that the company as a separate entity controls you yeah. rather right. than you controlling the company. It's a very artificial standard, uh, but when we do entrepreneurial H-1Bs, that's what we have to show. If, if you're interested in this, I don't want to bore everybody with this, we can talk separately. About and you have it. to show that the company can afford to pay you too, by the way. And if it's a new company and you don't have sufficient capitalization, that might be an issue as well. So and that's if you're actually going to provide services for that company. You can form it, you could be an officer, you just can't go to work and, and earn compensation from it. Okay. You know, okay. There might be creative ways to get you know, some dividends towards the end of the year, but that, that has you to be need to. I mean, your, your question is understood, but the answer to your question yeah. might not necessarily involve H-1Bs. There might be other things you can do. Okay. okay. Thank you. Great. Um, at this point, I, I'm going to transition to the next panel. Um, but please, we have, uh, we have a booth here. Some of the other attorneys have booths here. We are also available throughout the entire conference. We'll be here for two days. Come find us and sit down and talk to us. Uh, the next panel uh, is going to talk more, delve more into EB-5, the structure, how it works. And at this point, I'd like to bring up my associate, uh, Abhi Loya, who is head of Can-Am for India and the Middle East. So thank you.